I use microfossils, especially fossil pollen, to learn about vegetation that grew thousands of years ago. Vegetation tells us a lot about climate. Plant biomes, like tropical rainforest, for instance, often have climate terms in their names. When I read about paleontology in the news, the story is usually about the skeleton of a large, ancient animal. I don't do that kind of paleontology. Pollen leaves great records of ancient ecosystems for several reasons. One is that most of the plants that produce pollen make a lot of it every year. Just ask anyone with a ragweed allergy. The plants are making pollen to send DNA to other members of their species to make seeds with. But each individual pollen grain faces terrible odds, especially if it's carried by the wind instead of by bees or other animals. Most of that pollen is going to end up on the ground, stuck to leaves, or carried to some other kind of plant. Very few pollen grains are going to make it to the flower of a plant of their own species. Fortunately for fossil pollen analysts, some of the excess pollen ends up falling into lakes and wetlands. This brings us to another great thing about pollen. The exine, the resinous outer coat, doesn't decompose in environments without oxygen, like muddy sediments at the bottom of lakes or in wetlands. Sediment, including pollen, accumulates gradually in these environments. Younger sediments get deposited on top of older ones. In order to get samples of all the different sediment layers that have accumulated over time, researchers push a tubular sampler straight down into the mud and pull out a core of sediment for analysis. A third great thing about pollen is that the exines can be told apart. Oak exines look different from pine exines. Those look different from the ones on grass pollen or other types. Ferns, horsetails, and club mosses don't produce pollen, but they do make spores with exines that are about the size of pollen grains and can be told apart the same way. These exines are tiny and have to be identified under a microscope, usually at 400 times magnification. I generally identify and count at least 500 total grains per sample, 300 if it's sparse. Then I can generalize from percentages of different pollen types to relative abundances of different plants that were growing in the area when that sediment was deposited. I've used fossil pollen to answer different kinds of scientific questions over the years. I came from a background in forest ecology and realized that pollen analysis is a powerful tool to study ecological succession. Here's an example of what I mean. During the most recent ice age, much of Midwestern North America was covered by part of an ice sheet. As that ice melted, it left behind rocks and sediment that it had carried with it when it advanced. The first vegetation to colonize this newly exposed rubble was dominated by species that had grown near the ice sheet, ones that had been able to endure the changing climate. Over time, the sediment developed into soil. Other plant species moved in from further away, one at a time, over hundreds and thousands of years. I've also looked at shifts in the boundary between prairie and forest and how that's affected by wildfires. In another study, I compared the vegetation before and after the most recent ice age and used the differences in vegetation to understand differences in climate. Collecting mud from the bottom of a lake generally has to be done from boats, unless the lake has been drained or is filled up. A common coring rig is a wooden platform on top of a pair of canoes anchored at the deepest part of the lake. The platform has a hole in the middle and a frame that keeps the coring sampler perpendicular to the sediments. The frame also gives researchers leverage to push the sampler into the sediments and to pull it back out again. The cores I'm most familiar with are only a meter long, so we only take out a meter of sediment at a time. We keep careful track of how far we've pushed the core into the mud so that we know when we can open it to collect that next meter of sediment. As the sediment is retrieved, we force it out of the core onto a sheet of plastic food wrap laid over a piece of cut open PVC pipe. The sediment tends to be soft, so the PVC pipe supports it, and we don't want it drying out, and that's why we wrap it in food wrap. Then we add a layer of aluminum foil. When we get back to the lab, I cut each section of the core in half, and you note here that not all sediment layers are visible. I then take a much smaller metal cylinder and subsample the core section, this time drilling into the layers instead of against them. So each sample comes from sediments that were deposited over a relatively short time period. Even so, half millimeter thickness often contains material that took decades to be deposited. In order to see the pollen, I have to prep sediment by burning away all the other components or send it away to have someone else do it. This treatment takes hours, and the reagents include different kinds of strong acids and other caustic chemicals. 
What's left of the sediment afterwards is a mixture of pollen, spores, and other tough organic materials like charcoal and bits of algae. I put that mixture on a glass microscope slide. To protect my sample from contamination by modern pollen drifting in the air, I put a thin glass cover slip on top and stick it to the slide with nail polish because nail polish is often cheap and it works. At 400x, the field of view of the microscope is pretty small, about half a millimeter in diameter, so I'm not going to see many pollen grains in a single field. I have a microscope with a sliding stage, which lets me move the platform that the slide is clipped to while I'm looking through the microscope. I count the more common types of pollen using a clicker counter and tally the rarer ones with pencil and paper. The view itself tends to be a little cluttered because many kinds of organic remains make it through sediment processing. I can focus up and down a little to look past some of the other organics and to make out different features of the pollen grains. It takes practice and study to distinguish them. Grains can be turned at different angles, damaged, or covered by other organic material. Here we've got an elm grain on its side, a hazel grain with some algae on top of it, and a birch grain covered by a piece of charcoal. This is the data I collected from a single pollen sample from Pittsburgh Basin in Illinois. Even though I've lumped the rare types together in other trees and so forth, there are a lot of taxa here. Oak is the most abundant. I interpret this assemblage as having been deposited by a diverse, temperate, deciduous forest. It has tree types typical of both modern Illinois lowland forests, rich in oak and hickory, and of modern forests from further southeast. However, I analyzed 84 samples of the Pittsburgh Basin sediment record. 84 pie charts are going to take a long time to read, and you'll have forgotten the beginning of the story by the time you get to the end. So instead, I graph each type of pollen separately, abundance against depth. By the way, here's that sample we saw on the previous slide from 695 centimeters. It's just one point out of 84 on each of these graphs. This is a summary diagram. I've lumped the types into categories. For example, the boreal forest types include spruce, pine, birch, fir, and aspen. Rather than look at the individual pollen types, the reader is supposed to work out the collective vegetation changes over time. To make that easier, I broke the diagram into zones that have similar assemblages. Let's start at the bottom with the oldest deposits. Most of the pollen in zone PB1 came from boreal trees, trees that aren't common in central Illinois today. These samples came from glacial deposits from a previous ice age, the late Illinoisan. Above PB1 is PB2, deposited after that ice age, when the lake was surrounded by a diverse deciduous forest. That 695 centimeter assemblage is typical of zone PB2. PB3 follows PB2 when prairie plants became common. The trees didn't go away though. This pollen came from a savanna where forest and prairie meet and mix in North America. This ecosystem is rare today. And we'd do something similar for the next four zones. In some ways, pollen analysis hasn't changed much over the last century, but we now rely on statistical analyses to interpret our data. I generally compare ancient and modern pollen assemblages to find the best match and make ecological and climate comparisons based on their similarity. Other scientists use transfer functions or other kinds of sophisticated models appropriate to the scientific questions they're asking. I hope you found this video interesting. I'm probably going to do another one about what fossil pollen buried in Pittsburgh Basin tells us about Ice Age climate cycles. Eventually, I'll do more about other studies I've worked on. The data I showed you are described in an article I published in Quaternary Research, a paleoecology journal, and the stratigraphic diagrams were created using Keith Bennett's free software program, Simple.